Okay, we're going to get started. All right, so good evening, everyone. My name is Marguerite Anglin, and I am the Public Art Director for the City of Philadelphia in the Office of Arts, Culture, and the Creative Economy, uh, which we also shortened to OACCE. And on behalf of the city, I'd like to welcome you to our first public input meeting with the semifinalist artists who are competing to design, to design Philadelphia's Harriet Tubman statue. We are very happy to have these talented artists with us today who you're gonna meet shortly, and we're looking forward to tonight's discussion. The city of Philadelphia is excited to be commissioning this permanent statue of Harriet Tubman that will be located on the Northeast apron of City Hall. Known as the Moses of her people, Harriet Tubman was enslaved, escaped, and courageously helped many others gain their freedom as a conductor of the Underground Railroad. And Philadelphia plays an important part in Harriet Tubman's story being the place where she found freedom after escaping from slavery and being a frequent stop on the Underground Railroad. Philadelphia's Harriet Tubman statue will be the first statue of a black female historic figure in the city of Philadelphia's public art collection. And the statue represents a historic moment for our city that we want every Philadelphian to be part of. In October, 2022, OACCE conducted a public survey to inform the goals for the statue that were included in the call for artists that went out um, uh, looking for artists to apply for this opportunity. 515 people participated in the public goal survey and the goals that were resulting from that uh, for the statue are to celebrate Harriet Tubman's life, her story, her legacy, her significance to Philadelphia and her contributions to our nation's history. Also for the statue to bring untold stories to light, to inspire viewers to mirror Harriet Tubman's contributions in their own communities, and also to evoke an emotional response of pride, inspiration, and empowerment to all who visit City Hall. I'm very excited for these artists to um, uh, be in this, in this position where they're going to be competing and they're going to be providing proposals for the statue to meet all of these goals. And today's meeting is a big part of accomplishing that. Before we get into the rest of today's meeting, I'd like for Kelly Lee um, with our office to introduce herself and if she'd like to say a few words. Great, thanks Marguerite. Um, just really briefly, I just wanna thank these five amazing talented artists for applying um, for this opportunity. Um, I have every confidence that um, whoever gets this um, project will do an amazing job and they're going to create something that we're all going to be so proud of. And I also want to thank all of the uh, participants who are on this call. It's This is Philadelphia statue. This We know how passionate you are about Harriet Tubman and we really want you to express that um, to these artists. They have some really good questions. Um, that they're going to ask of you. We know Philadelphians are brutally honest um, and we expect um, that we're going to learn a lot about what you want to see in your statue. So with that, um, I want to thank the artists again and thank everyone who's participating. Thanks, Marguerite. Thanks, Kelly. Okay, Rachel, can we have the next slide? Thanks. So uh, just the goals of tonight's meeting. Um, so we're hosting this public input meeting, as, as Kelly mentioned, because we want to hear from you. Tonight's meeting will provide an opportunity for you to meet the semifinalist artists um, who are competing for the Harriet Tubman statue. Also, tonight you'll have the artists, as uh, Kelly mentioned, they have prepared questions for you, our audience, that will help them to understand Philadelphia's aspirations for the Harriet Tubman statue, what's most important to you. Um, about the statue, how the statue can be relevant to Philadelphia today. Um, so we want to hear from you. Uh, this was going to be an opportunity for the semifinalists to hear from the public before they create their statue design proposals. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you what stories you think this artwork should tell. Also, we're going to share how you can stay involved as the project continues. Next slide. So we have formed an advisory committee with very diverse perspectives. Um, I'm not gonna read the, the list here. You can read this list of uh, our, our members, um, but 
I will say that the, uh, the, our committee is comprised of members of Harry Tubman's family, uh, community representatives, historians, educators, visual artists, um, high school students, cultural leaders, and public art professionals. And the role of the committee is to guide the selection of the artist um, to help ensure also that the statue reflects and connects to Philadelphia and that your feedback, uh, the public's feedback is incorporated in the design. Next slide. So just a little bit of housekeeping. This public meeting is being recorded and a link will be made available online for those who were not able to attend. Also during the discussion session, we're going to be inviting you to share your comments using the raise your hand feature that's located at the bottom menu of your Zoom window. And when you're called on, you'll be unmuted to speak. Uh, our semifinalists have, like, as I mentioned, prepare questions for you. So we encourage a conversation with the semifinalists, but we also ask that you respect everyone's time and, abil and ability to speak during this meeting. Um, we will be sending out a document, a Google document, so that you can respond in writing. If you don't have an opportunity to speak today, there will be an opportunity for additional written comments to be made after this meeting. Okay, so our agenda tonight, uh, we've already gone through the welcoming goals. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Harriet Tubman statue commissioning process to date. Uh, we'll introduce you to our semifinalists. And, and then we'll have a discussion with the semifinalists based on the questions that they would like to ask you. And then we'll leave, we'll open the floor to any additional comments from the audience and go over some next steps in the process. Okay, so here's what's happened so far in this public art competition. Um, in October, uh, 2022, OACCE conducted a public input survey to inform the goals for the statue that would be included in the description of the project in the call for artists. And 515 people participated in that survey. From November to 30th to January 26, 2023, the Harriet Tubman statue call for artists was distributed locally and nationally. Uh, and that was uh, allowed artists who were interested to submit their qualifications, submit uh, images of their past artwork and responses to short questions about this opportunity. On March the 31st, 2023, the city announced that five semifinalist artists out of 50 applicants were selected by the African American Historic Statue Committee to move on to create statue design proposals. And all of these artists, as Kelly mentioned, um, all of these artists have demonstrated capacity through their previous works of art, um, that they have a history of creating high quality uh, monumental statues that are both engaging and impactful. So we're, we're really excited to have them here with us today. And that brings us to today, to uh, our first public input meeting with the semifinalists. So the full schedule is also online for the rest of the process, but we're gonna talk about some of the next steps um, a little bit later on in this meeting. Next slide, please. So before we get into tonight's discussion, I, I wanna, he asked each of the artists to briefly introduce themselves and, and what they do. And so I'm going to call on the artist uh, in order here, uh, Vinny. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Vinny Bagwell. I am a representational figurative sculptor. Uh, I enhance my three dimensional sculptures with bar relief sculpture to. Uh, extend my storytelling and to add visual intrigue. Um, I've been sculpting since 1993. I've been doing public art since 1995. Um, it is a joy to be a finalist for this project. Um, it's so marvelous now that there are so many calls uh, coming out um, because it gives myself and others the opportunity to balance the narrative. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Vinny. Richard Blake. Richard, you might be muted. Hello, am I, is my voice coming through? Okay. Now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was uh, about to say how proud I am to be included in uh, this commission to honor uh, Harriet Tugman, 
one great uh, American hero, and I think the first black woman to be publicly installed uh, as a monument in Philadelphia. I have been in over 100 uh, national and international exhibitions. I've received awards from some of the nation's most venerated institutions and recently received the uh, Sculptors Medal of Honor from the National Sculpture Society. And uh, I look forward to uh, participating in the project and to putting my skills to making this a truly uh, honorable monument uh, to Harriet Tugman's achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'd like Tanda Francis to introduce herself now. Hi, again, I'm Tanda Francis, um, figure of sculpture. Um, I've been known to do enormous money, um, colossal heads in public spaces to actually just get our voice out there, our presence known, you know, very clearly. Uh, I feel it's my mission and uh, I'm excited to be here with these artists, with you guys to actually, you know, to see the next step to see how we can get a beautiful monument, just part of history into the ground. Thanks. Thank you, Tanda. Alvin Pettit. Yes, hello everybody. Great to be here, great to meet everybody. Quick history on me, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. I now reside in the New York Tri-State area. I've been working as an artist for the last 30 years. Graduated from School of Visual Arts back in the late 80s. I've been doing it ever since. I'm a figurative sculptor and painter. And my passion is also involved in heavily in civil rights. I come from a family of civil rights activists, parents, grandparents. So this is I feel my contribution as an artist uh, how I contribute to the civil rights movement. I do feel we are in a modern day civil rights movement and I'm so glad to see the artists and all these other great artists as being part of that. And I'm just happy to be a part of this new movement that's actually you know, being partially led by a lot of us artists. That's great. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, and Basil Watson. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here as a finalist. Uh, for the great city of Philadelphia's project to erect Harriet Tubman, one of our great heroes through the uh, era of slavery into the freedom of African-Americans. I've been working as a sculptor full-time from 1980, 43 years. I am a figurative sculptor and um, I have accomplished over 40 public sculptures, most recently Martin Luther King for the city of Atlanta and the Windrush Monument for the city of London in, at Waterloo Station, London. I look forward to this opportunity because it's an exciting uh, gift to be able to contribute to the dialogue of uh, diversity and freedom in our society. So thank you very much and all the best to all the finalists because I expect Philadelphia to be the winner. That was a great summary. Thank you, uh, Basil, for saying that. Um, so thanks everyone also for sharing a bit about yourself and about the work that you do as artists. And I'm excited for us to get into our discussion now. Can we have our next slide, please? <laughs> Okay, so to kick things off, the first question is for our semifinalists. We'd like you to share about a little bit about, uh, you know, if you could share the first time you learned about Harriet Tubman and what resonated with you at that time. And I'm gonna open that up to any of you five, if anyone wants to go first. I will take the lead. Um, uh, I don't remember when it was the first time that I heard about or learned about Harriet Tubman it's many, many years ago. But uh, I have always been struck by her courage uh, to be a conductor on the, the underground railway, railway and to, to, to resist um, slavery in every sinew of her being. So, um, uh, so 
for me, her courage and uh, the, the strength of Harriet Tubman is what really resonates with me. Great. Thank you for sharing that bit, Basil. Anyone else want, like to go first or would like to, like to go next? I'd, I'd like to go. This is Canada. Okay. Um, I was going to also say, like, I, I have no idea when I first heard of Harry Tubman. She's always been, been like, a part of the life. Um, it's, it's, um, so I don't, I can't recall the first time I, I, um, I heard of her, but I've always known her, that she was um, a powerful woman. Um, uh, she's a, a part of our history. And, and honestly, to the point where um, it's something that I felt was repeated to the point of that you can totally take it for granted at some point in my life. I remember feeling that when I, when I actually really, when it really resonated you know, if you put yourself in her shoes, you put yourself in that time period, you know, that's when it really, like, I, I was an older, you know, I was an, an adult by then when I really, it really it touched me. And especially reading, like, I um, most recently read the jail, jail Break Out of History. And I don't know if anybody has read that. It's um, by Patrilli. I mean, she really, I mean, it's really, like, um, the the profound um, situation that she was that that trouble was in and what she overcame it's like it's something that we actually could be in the danger of having it being um, slip away from us in some way because we we're, we are so used to hearing her story but when we could that's why I think for our job is so important like where we can actually like really just punch like really kind of like have it hit you know, the hardest of um, of the people who are who are there to see um, the piece the piece that's in front of us, you know, eventually. So yeah, um, so I don't have a, a member of the beginning, but I do uh, feel attached more at, as I get older to the history. And even like my last piece, actually, the last um, uh, kind of like alter ego piece that I have out there happens to be in a in a underground railroad like you know like a, a site that was really like um like a hub in in uh New jersey actually and i just just actually really recently found out it actually really ended up there in some you know short story um but it's um i feel attached to the piece i feel attached to this project um now and that's you know again it's an honor thank you tanda kind of continue our history thank you tanda for those comments. I'm gonna call on um, uh, Richard. Yes, I, uh, I, I would have to agree uh, with uh, some of my uh, fellow sculptors when they say that they can't really recall exactly the first time that they had heard about Miss Tugman. But over the years, what I can say is that she has uh, actually developed in scope and depth and in every degree as I read and learn more about our history, uh, the good and the bad. Um, I was very impressed. I think it was uh, Douglas who had, was talking about how brave she was and insinuating that her spirit and her bravery surpassed his. And also Tugman, saying that she could have saved so many more slaves than what she did had they even realized they were slaves. So it, it not only speaks to her bravery uh, on every level uh, as a spy, you know, underground railroad, uh, you know, as a soldier, but also her insightfulness into the institution of slavery and what it was doing to the nation. And of course, just how devastating it was to Blacks. Yeah, we, we owe her much. Yeah. Thanks for that, Richard. Okay, Alvin. Yeah, so like everybody else said, just to echo everybody, I don't really remember because I know growing up, uh, my father kept such an extensive library on Black histories, whether it was uh, Tubman, W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, uh, Douglas, so uh, I just kind of always knew these names mentioned in our house 
from a baby since I was three or four years old, I could speak. So couldn't really say when I actually heard about her, but I was always been fascinated by her story. And a lot of these, um, can't even just say bigger than just civil rights activists. They're really the foundation of the liberators of our society. These are the people that, yeah, you had you know, a group of white men that wrote the constitution and whatnot, and the bill of rights on a piece of paper, but it was these people that actually brought it into a reality that actually now um, benefits immigrants, women, everything. These are the people that really made the country a reality and not just an idea. And me growing up, I was always a big comic book fan. I used to collect comic books from uh, floor to ceiling and whatnot. And it was when I heard of stories like Harry Tubman or I got, was old enough to understand them, these became almost like real life superheroes to me. Like what she did was really beyond comprehension. I don't think any of us nowadays can really conceive what we see in the movie, what we read in the books about her is really beyond our real comprehension. And when I do my work, I actually like to try to capture that mythology. I mean, I say the word mythology, but obviously this is real life African-American mythology because it's real people, not fictional characters or, you know, made up figures, but it almost takes on a life of its own that's larger than life. And I always like to capture that in my work rather than just copying a photograph or something like that. I always like to just capture that mythology. Like when I just recently, a couple of years ago, completed the uh, um, Mary McLeod Bethune monument. And I try to capture that essence of the figure and what they're about. And, you know, I'm really anxious to really get on this one and do this one and capture, try to capture Harry Tubman in that very mythological larger than life figure, which he was. Thank you, Alvin. And Vinnie Bagwell. I am so old. Um, I grew up during Black Power. So 1968, sixth grade, Mrs. France, my first Black teacher. And um, she made an effort to introduce us to all of the Black icons. Um, and, and me loving good stories, these were the most amazing stories to me. Um, you know, the thing that I would say about Harriet Tubman, the kids would now call her an old G. You know, she really wasn't having it. Like you're with me or you're not. And um, I, I remember loving her audacity, her courage, um, you know, wanting to be that strong, that brave, um, that willing not only to uh, escape myself, but to go back for my family. Um, I can really relate to her. And, and it's funny that you asked that question. I had to stop and really think about it. I'm like, I think I was sixth grade. And then I, you know, I had to really think about like, what teacher was that, what, whatever. And um, I just remember, you know, having the teacher had the pictures of the people like around the classroom up top, like where they normally have the ABCs. She had pictures of all the black icons. And, um, you know, she took the time to talk about them. And, you know, it was a, it was a conversation. We also did a lot of uh, current events and things like that. But um, I'm happy to say, I do remember learning about her and, um, it's just really, it's like deja vu. It's interesting how you, you see something and you see it again, and then it's really relevant to your life. So um, this is a very exciting time to be able to give voice to her story, um, you know, to authenticate um, her life and the meaning of her life. And so um, that's what I know about Harriet Tubman. Thank you, Vinny. And thank you, everyone. It's clear that each of you each of you has a special connection to Harriet Tubman's life and story. And so we look forward to seeing how that connection will help you to create meaningful designs for this statue. And also each of you, as I mentioned before, have prepared some questions um, for the audience for you to help, uh, to help you understand what's most important to um, Philadelphians as you begin to create your statue designs. Um, so we're gonna have, so in the next few slides, we're gonna have a question from each of our semifinalists for the audience in about, about 10 minutes each, um, each question. And we wanna to try to get as many people to respond as possible. I'm gonna ask our OACCE staff to help us. Uh, Barry will be calling on people and will allow you to be unmuted so you can share your thoughts. Um, Rachel will be taking notes. And just as a reminder, this we really want this to be a dialogue. You'll see the chat has been disabled because we wanna make sure that comments are aligned 
with the questions and it's hard when there's a kind of a running commentary. Also because this meeting is being recorded, we wanna emphasize the verbal conversation that's happening during this meeting. Um, and as I mentioned before, we will be sending out a document with these questions so you can respond in writing if, if we don't get to you today or if we don't have opportunity to respond today. Um, so uh, also I wanna say, Rachel, when she's taking notes on what you're saying, the goal is for us to just capture the essence. Um, we're gonna be doing this in real time. So please you know, uh, uh, forgive any typos or anything like that. Um, and one last thing is that don't feel the need to repeat uh, what someone else has said if it's been said um, already. We really wanna get as many um, people to provide unique um, feedback and share as much as possible. So with that said, uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. And we're gonna let Basel, yeah, and we're gonna let Basel ask his question, uh, ask your question first, which is up on the slide. Uh, how do Philadelphians see the character of Harriet Tubman? and what is her dominant characteristic? Okay, thank you, Bayes Fossil. So for those of you in our audience, please use the raise your hand feature um, to share your thoughts about Harry Tubman's character. Uh, Barry, do we have any raised hands? Oh, okay, I see a few. The first one I see is Iris. So you now have permission to talk. Go ahead, Iris, you're unmuted. Iris? Okay, okay I'm unmuted now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I see Harry Tubman as um, an unwavering advocate for freedom um, and she wasn't scared. That's great. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Do we have any other raised hands? I see Mona. Uh, give me one moment. And you now <laughs> have to speak. I see her as a visionary. Great one. Thank you, Mona. So could you elaborate on what you thought her vision for uh, her vision was? Um, I, I see a visionary, um, see her as seeing Philadelphia, not just as a place of refuge, but a place where people could grow, not just in freedom, but be allowed to express themselves economically, um, their own vibe, if you will. If you um, think about the areas of Philadelphia where, especially, um, I think it's the Seventh Ward, where most of the um, African-Americans in Philadelphia excelled, excelled in building businesses, excelled as artists, excelled as, um, you know, purveyors. And I think that her vision for me, a vision in for her in Philadelphia is to bring people, not just to pass through, but people who would sort of, it's almost like leaving a trail for future generations. And I think that's what happened during this um, progression of the Underground Railroad. Thank you for Thank that, you Mona. Very much. Any more raised hands, Barry? Uh, Beverly, if you would like to speak now. Hi, hi everyone. <clears throat> I'm just going to throw some adjectives out there that are uh, current that we hear a lot today, um, but definitely is a, is or was expressed in Harriet Tubman's essence, the essence of her life that she gave to us, everyone, and that is bravery, confidence, purposeful spirituality, mindset, leadership, energy, 
and hope. Mm -hmm. All of those words collectively was the essence of everything that she did and showed whether she spoke it or in her actions or anything that she wrote or anything that she delivered. That that kind of, those are the words that everyone, if you want to be positive, if you want to get ahead in life, if you want to do whatever you want to do, these are the adjectives that bring something into fruition. And that's what her whole life was about. And no, she wasn't scared. And I believe that she just felt that she was going to be protected for however long. And however long that was, she was going to give it 200% in all of these ways. Thank That's you. great. Thank you. That, that, that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Okay. Mary, keep it coming. Susie, if you'd like to speak now. Susie, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. I would Hello. just like to add that... Um, she was multifaceted. I think sometimes when you get a historical figure, you know, Moses of her people, Underground Railroad, all that is true, but it gets to be kind of like a cliche. And she was definitely multifaceted, definitely a freedom seeker, but she, like uh, she was also an entrepreneur. She was a spy. She was a nurse. You know, she she was a community organizer before there was a term for that. You know, the, the home that she developed for the aged up in New York. She was a... a environmentalist she planted you know trees um she uh was married and then she married again and married a younger man so uh she she was a full woman and, and uh, I, I don't know how you can even capture that all in one sculpture but uh she's more than a cliche she's more than just the Moses of her people yeah such such true words thank you for that she was all those things and more Yes, thank you. Uh, Maisha, if you would like to speak, you now have permission to do so. <laughs> yes, hi. Um, when I think about um, Nina Harriet's life, that what she was able to do all these things that people are using to describe her, basically because of her discipline and her determination. She was disciplined and determined and well-trained. They, she didn't get that way by herself. She was well-trained by her parents. She was well-trained by others that was a part of her network. So the discipline, the, the determination and being well-trained, she couldn't have done these things without the training she had. Her father and her mother taught her how to read the forest, how to read the sky, how to use herbs. And then she learned from others, enslaved Africans who escaped and others in the Underground Railroad who also trained her. And she put that together, her determination to use those things she learned to, to free others. So the discipline and the training and the determination, I think, made her all these other things possible that she was doing. Thank you. Thank you, Maisha. Maisha's cat is the hype person, <laughs> the hype man. Like, yes, yes, yes. Excuse us for our cat. <laughs> no, no, that's the hype man saying yes, all that. <laughs> Up next, we have Ife. I just allow permission. So if you want to unmute, you can speak now. Yes, I, I mean, all, all of the above is just wonderful and beautiful. I would just also want to add that she was fearless and made a great sacrifice uh, for our freedom. Thank you, Ife. You're welcome, thank you. And I believe that's everyone we have on our list for right now. Okay. All right, well, these are, these are wonderful, wonderful traits and wonderful characteristics. And I love that we're capturing the fullness of Harriet um, thank you, everyone who has 
um, responded to these uh, comments about Harriet Tubman's characteristics. So we're gonna move on to Richard Blake for him to ask his question. Richard, uh, go right ahead. You're, you're muted. I think, uh, I think my machine has a mind of its own there. Um, but I was curious, with all the uh, sculptures that we have in Philadelphia, and it's quite a few, I think we, we had at least at one point worldwide, uh, a really considerable number of, of public monuments uh, that were out there. But it's not just the number, it's the wide array, uh, and it moves some uh, Jacques Lipschitz sculpture today, which I was looking at across from City Hall, and it had to do with the Holocaust, and which is a very abstract, cubistic uh, representation of what the Jews went through. Uh, to a lot of the Civil War monuments, which are almost academically realistic. And my question was, what, what do the people of Philadelphia wish to see in terms of the interpretation of uh, Harriet Tubman? I mean, she was so many things, succeeded in virtually everything, and is not just a uh, powerful black woman, but she is one of the most powerful Americans. Uh, and, and I think should be seen as that. And certainly we should be proud of her as a black woman. But do you uh, see this as being a sculpture that should be recognizable, first of all, in terms of uh, Harriet Tubman? And I think that, that almost answers itself as far as I'm concerned, but I would like to hear uh, other points of view, or do you want to see it where the expression is so strong that maybe the realistic, recognizable parts are not as important? Just like to hear some feedback, if you would. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Jacqueline, if you'd like to answer. You may have to unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. I thought I was going to respond to the first one. So the primary visual statement I think would be that of her, once again, I'm going back to an adjective determination, that the seriousness that from other sculptors I've seen is always a sense of purpose, always a sense of her, of urgency. And so I think that the visual statement for me would be when I use, this, if I say the word strength, I, I mean it from the standpoint of seriousness of purpose. And I think that was mentioned before, but that determination in her face is something that I would love to see perhaps in a, in a newer way. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maisha. If you would like to answer, you have, um, you're able uh, to do that. Well, you know, one thing I would say once I saw the finalist was, I was very pleased that you were all figurative artists because I, I wouldn't want to see her in any abstract way. You know, similar, you know, even though the, the, the statue of Martin Luther King that they did is a beautiful statue where it's just the shoulders and the hands but not him and his wife, you know, that kind of abstraction. You know, I, I, I want to see her and her fullness figured to, so people don't have to guess who it is or wondering who it is. So something that the visual statement is very strong and very clear and not open to a lot of interpretations. Like, is that Harriet? Is that, is that Nana Harriet? Is that this? We'll know it's her because it's so strong and so forceful, the imagery of her. And I also wouldn't like to see her alone. Most of the statues a lot, well, 
there was one with her with a child, but she did this because of a community of people. And so, so she wasn't just this lone figure. She was able to do this because she was connected and some kind of way to interpret how the support system she had with the Underground Railroad, the other ones who helped her. And, and so people get a sense of she was great because of who other people assisted her to make her who she was. So, but it's clear that it's her, not just a hand of Nina Harriet holding a gun or just her foot crossing the Mason Dixon, but her full body strong and all her, her strength. And so that, that's how I en envision her. And I was very happy that most of the work that I've seen that you have all done has also been figurative work. Thank you. Thank you, Maisha. Jacob, if you'd like to speak. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, first I, I want to uh, compliment the city of Philadelphia and your office for um, having a transparent process in contrast to New York City where there is a statue of Harriet Tubman in Harlem. And um, the process of selection of the uh, final artist who uh, did the statue um, was not transparent to the community. Uh, also the statue in Harlem to Harriet uh, is facing south and not north. And uh, I personally, as the director of the Harlem Historical Society, um, collected over 4,000 signatures asking that the Department of Parks and the Department of Cultural Affairs have Harriet facing north. And they uh, asked us for a half a million dollars to have her facing north. And uh, we didn't raise that money. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask that the city of Philadelphia, when you do the sighting of Harriet, that she faced north towards freedom. Um, I like the idea of the statue evoking a younger Harriet Tubman, uh, probably in her 20s, where she first started to uh, guide these escapes to freedom um, of her. She started with her relatives. Uh, I would like, I would like, uh, I would like there to be the pistol that she always carried in her waistband because she was ready for the bounty hunters. Um, and so she, she always carried a pistol. So I would like that historical accuracy to be depicted in the, um, in the sculpture. Um, her fortitude, her determination, even when she was in her 20s, of course, she had that. And she was very realistic in her escapes. Uh, and she did it mostly at night. So uh, even though I like the, uh, the draft uh, from uh, one of the finalists uh, with her holding the lamp, uh, I love the symbolism of that. However, I don't think it's uh, realistic. Um, so I would like, I would like the danger that she faced uh, to be evoked in the sculpture. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Those are those are great comments, and, and I have to say that the, one of the it's it's significant for us to be citing uh, Harriet Tubman, the statue on the north side of, of City Hall. We um, we agree that that symbolism is important of her traveling north and finding her freedom here in Philadelphia. Um, and so thank you for that comment amongst your other comments. We have time for, uh, I think one or two more responses to Richard's uh, question. Alicia, if you'd like to respond. Hi, um, I like Jacob's um, comments. Um, with the city of Philadelphia is known for being the city of first. Um, we claim a lot of first in Philadelphia and historically, 
things kind of like jumped off here in the city of independence. So with this statue, I'd like to see um, Harriet Tubman represented um, for freedom, like a very strong freedom message. Um, I like the youthful aspect of it that demonstrate um, some, femini some femininity um, with her, but also joining the culture of Philadelphia being first and Harriet Tubman's effort to lead people through Philadelphia and being first um, to do so. So I want to capture some of the Philadelphia part of, of her travels in the, um, in the rendering of her statue. Because, I, you know, it's here in Philly, and I'm very excited that we're getting our own Harriet Tubman statue, but to tie it all together, we're known for the city of first. It's Mother's Day. It's the zoo. It's the colleges, the Museum of Sciences, um, books, magazines, and so many things just jumped off here in Philly. So I think that statue should kind of articulate some of Philadelphia's attitude, and that's being a fighter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we are gonna move on. Um, why don't we go to Vinnie Bagwell's question? Hi there. Um, I can't read that, it's so tiny, but I do recall uh, saying that I'm really wondering what Philadelphians want to see in this Kodak moment. What moment is this? Is this the moment that she realizes that she's in Philadelphia? Is this days later after she's gotten her bearings and she's met some people in Philadelphia? It, it, what moment is this that we are trying to capture of her that symbolizes Philadelphia? This is a site-specific artwork. And so the question is, how do I know she's in Philadelphia? What, what, what moment is this? Thank you, Vinny. Any responses to what moment in Harriet Tubman's life that speaks about her time in Philadelphia do you feel is the most important for the statue to depict? And also Vinny asked, um, what is Harriet doing in reaction to this moment? Yes, thank you. Sure. Barry, do we have any raised hands? We do. Some of them are raised from the previous question, but I'll go from top to bottom. Uh, Cassandra, if you would like to answer. Um, uh, a couple of thoughts there. Um, I've read through um, William Still's Underground Railroad to look for descriptions of, of Harriet, you know, how, how other people viewed Harriet coming into town with mm -hmm. her charges in tow. Um, and whereas the people that she escorted were happy and uh, I couldn't believe that they'd done it. She was always quiet and stern. She didn't have much to say. Um, she was just about her business. Um, and another idea, um, the most recent image of her seems to cap, she's sitting and she, it seems to capture a very young Harriet Tubman, a very feminine Harriet Tubman. Um, and you know, in, in all of our histories of her being the warrior, being the spy, being the leader, um, I, I don't get a strong sense of, I think the previous person said it, her femininity. She was a woman of her time, a Victorian woman, as it were, an enslaved woman. But when she had her moments to choose how to be represented, she chose to be a demure uh, Victorian woman, um, lace at the neck. Um, we, we, I, it was, I took part in a recent exhibit and one of the uh, exhibitors uh, portrayed her hand holding a lantern with beautiful nails. <laughs> and I don't know if that was the case, but just those nails captured something uh -huh. you know, about her feminine nature. She was a woman. And somebody else said, you know, she, she, when she married again, 
she chose a younger man. I mean, there, yeah. there's something in that that I would like to see reflected in this statue. And maybe that would be what would be different for, for our statue. Uh, she's a warrior, but she's, she is a woman. She's a woman, a Victorian woman of her time, of her time. Thank you, Cassandra. If I could ask everyone to um, answer this question about the moment in her life um, and what she's doing in reaction to this moment. Don't forget to respond to that part. Tracy Beck, if you would like to respond. I think um, the idea of showing her at the the moment when she realizes she's at Philadelphia must be one where she would be showing great relief and great joy personally. I I, I agree with that. You know, there, there has to be a lot of emotion when you have been frightened, but as they say, feeling the fear and pressing on and to finally get to a point where you realize you're free. There, there must be a lot of emotion in that moment. Thank you, Tracy. Beverly, if you would like to take a moment to respond. Um, it, I don't think it is an alignment, but I'll say this, um, being in the uh, real estate field for 20 plus years and seeing so many people come to Philadelphia to visit as a tourist or to find a new home for a new job, they're so excited. When Philadelphians, we couldn't complain a lot about a lot of things, but the people that are coming here, it's a, a new beginning for them. They're excited about the museums, all the activities, um, the, the amount of different cultures and food and the many communities that we have here. The opportunity that they think they will find here. It's a very positive. It's, it's interesting for me all the time because I, I'm at both ends of it all the time. I hear the negative stuff all the time. And then the next day I could be out all day with someone just loving Philadelphia, loving the places that I've taken them to, to get to learn what the city is about, regardless of what they see in the news, regardless of the crime, regardless of the shootings, regardless of all of that, they love Philadelphia. And so I would assume that uh, Harriet and her followers felt the same way, that regardless of what negativity that could be in this new place, with what they don't even know that's here, that's negative, they still, just like most immigrants that come to the United States, they still have hope that things are going to be different for them when they arrive. Perspective and mindset. Yes. These are great. I think we have time for one more response to Vinny's question. Barry, is anyone raising their hands? I see a few hands. Um, I'm seeing some names that we've heard from before. If there's anybody who hasn't spoken yet but would like to participate, uh, please feel free to raise your hands. And in the meantime, how about we hear from Jacqueline? Well, I had my hand up and I had it down, but I, when I read that, I was thinking of Harriet, of, uh, Harriet Tubman and William Still. I know you can't do two, <laughs> but he plays such a critical role with respect to their, their uh, relationship. And so... I don't know how that could be fashioned, but uh, I, I think about that a lot when I think about her being in Philadelphia. Um, I, I'm trying to figure what was already what was already here um, in terms of you know some location. So 
Um, I don't know what else we could put, what else could, you know, be background or just be a part of it. But I, I think of, um, I think of William Still. So I just, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Barry, did anyone, uh, in addition to the ones raising their hand, any other new people? Nope, none yet. Okay, let's move move on. Um, oh, okay. Actually, somebody just raised, do we have time for one more response? Yeah, actually we do. Uh, Mona, I don't know if we've heard from them yet but you have permission to speak. Yeah, I did speak um, earlier, but I think when I think, what is she doing in her reaction? I think she's looking for the, the place, the spaces, what will be the spaces for the people that are coming with her and where, where they'll be. You know, when her reaction could be, you know, I'm here in this place and I see these buildings and where are the safe spaces? And because Philadelphia, housed um you know people who were escaping into freedom in some of those spaces coming through philadelphia I, maybe her thought was where are the spaces you know how am i going to protect and shield my people you know in this space in this place i don't know but this, this place has to be safe that that air of relief you know like someone said um early relief and joy because it had to be a feeling that she had that um, said, okay, this is gonna be okay. Thank you, Mona. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next question, which is from Tanda. And I think some people, I feel like maybe someone somehow peeked into the next slide because it's been a couple of comments that are similar to what Tanda wants to ask everyone. So go ahead and read that slide there, Tanda. Uh, it's basically, uh, there's an image of Harriet Tubman, where she is in her youth. Given her, leg her legacy of leadership and the stories and images we have set in our minds, is there an attachment to seeing her aged or are we open to seeing her differently? This is a great question. Barry, are we getting any raised hands? Yes. Let's go to, there's a few coming in. Let's go to Alicia. You might have to unmute yourself. My hand had been up from before. I didn't, I didn't raise it for this one. Sorry. Ah, uh, no worries. Are we waiting for others? And uh, Alicia can, okay. Oh, it looks like some people put their hands up and bring them down. Um, Iris, was your hand up for this question? Yes, my hand is up, but I want to make sure people who haven't spoke had a ch have a chance to speak first. So if there's someone who hasn't spoken yet, I would yield my time. If not, I can <laughs> I can make a comment quickly. Yeah, we'd like Iris. to hear your feedback. Okay. I would like to see her younger only because this is where she escaped to. So at the time she escaped, she was younger. Um, so that's just my personal preference. Um, and I know most of the pictures that exist of her uh, are of her as an older woman. I think there's one or two pictures of her as a younger person. But I think um, a younger interpretation would be more true to accurate to history at her time in Philadelphia. Thank you, Iris. Barry, do we have any other hands raised? Let's see. Jacqueline, uh, is your hand raised for question number four? No, no, it's not. But every time I put up, raise it, lower it, <laughs> it does what it wants. 
I'm still thinking, but thank you. <laughs> okay, I believe that's everybody we have for this question. Okay. All right. So Actually, let's we, we just got a raised hand from Leslie. If you would like to share, uh, you can unmute yourself. Okay, good, ev uh, good evening. Um, I would like to see the different phases of her life embedded in the statue some type of way. I'm, I'm not sure how that can be done, but I'd like it to be noted about the, the spiritual relationship that she had. You know, she felt that God was always with her and she was in contact with him. Um, the sadness, but not really sadness about um, having to leave her husband behind and also, you know, the part about the Underground Railroad, her helping people to escape. But once she did escape, becoming that lady, as everyone has um, mentioned earlier, where she just became an, an advocate and opened up homes for the elderly. So maybe some type of way all that history could be put in there because she did so many different things. That's it. Thank you, Leslie. Any other any other comments about seeing Harriet Tubman where she was in her youth or any attachment to seeing her age versus seeing her differently? Renee, if you would like to answer, you can unmute yourself now. Um, yes, I'd like to see her in her youth, actually. Um, and I think that would be a nice picture, particularly if you can incorporate all the other adjectives, her strength and her fortitude with the um, with getting people to freedom. I think if we could see her as a younger woman, you know, somewhere in between 20 and 30, I think that would be good for just the longevity of the statue. Thank you, Renee. Okay. Uh, Barry, if we don't have any more raised hands. We actually we have a few. There are a few hands that have gone up. Okay, if we not, have we have a few minutes actually okay. to, to yeah, so go ahead. Stephanie, if you'd like to answer, you can unmute yourself now. Hi, I think it would be great to see a younger version of Harriet. And I think seeing a younger version not only would be inspiring to younger people, but it also would set this version apart from other sculptures that are out there of Harriet. Thank you, Stephanie. And if Sista, you would like to respond, you can unmute yourself now and do so. Hi, yes. Yeah. So when I think of a statue, um, typically they, how it's going to be formatted, there's going to be like a front and a back, you know, right or left. So potentially, I would like to see the statue show her in her timeline, not just necessarily in her youth, but also through her elderhood to show that she um, continued the journey. She didn't just wait, got comfortable when she was given recognition, when she was given more accolades and more support, did she stop? Um, when I think of Harriet Tubman, she persevered and she taught people as she went along. So potentially it could be something that I'm envisioning as we're having this conversation. Um, the front of it could be more so of, um, of showing in her youth, but the backside could show a different side of her, literally of her in, in, in aging. And so um, it's almost as if, you know, when she was facing maybe North at one time going in one way, but she did eventually go South another time and she may have looked this way. So it could show not only the legacy of her work and her time where she could have been a little bit more upright and strong, but then we also know that a lot of the imagery that we do see of her was when she was older um, and, you know, still strong, but nonetheless, I feel as if we potentially could see um, both sides to show um, the strength of her fortitude and her mission to see people through and that it lasted for as long as it did and still does because her work 
in her energy, even in her essence of being an ancestor is still with us and is still guiding people. And so I, I would like to see potentially how that could be created um, figuratively um, for this project. Thank you, Sister Malili. We're getting some really, really interesting, um, you know, some really great comments. I knew that this was going to be very helpful to our semifinalists, but this is just, just great, all the different ideas that they're getting. There's a lot that they're, I'm sure that they're all taking in and that Tanda is probably taking in from this question in particular. Um, so we're going to move on to our next, our, our next question, which is from um, Alvin. Yes, okay. So um, I just wanna make one comment right quick. You know, I heard a lot of um, feedback and I heard the word fearless used a lot and uh, not scared. And I kind of like to approach it from a little bit of an opposite. And I think maybe she was scared. She was, it was a fearful journey. And the, the, the power doesn't come from being fearless or being void of fear. It comes from overcoming that and harnessing it and turning it into something that you can use as a strength. So, I mean, you don't walk through the woods at night and rescue people and walk into potential death as many times as she did and not be scared unless you're void of something that's human. So that emotion is what I like to try to capture in my work in this piece when I do this piece. And also going to the youth thing, I kind of like that idea too, because even when I did the uh, Mary McLeod Bethune sculpture, Everywhere I looked around, she was always elderly with a cane and stuff. And I did her in her youth to kind of capture that genesis of the beginning, that ambition that the youth have that takes them into that journey right before they're about to start it. And that was kind of my concept behind the Mary McLeod Thing sculpture. But getting to my question, um, as residents and community members of the city of Philadelphia, I'm curious to which existing monuments or public works of art murals, architectural installments, et cetera, inspire you the most? Which pieces do you find yourselves gazing at the longest, conversating about most frequently, or even criticizing the most? What is it about these particular pieces that provoke such an emotional response from you? Thanks, Alvin. Pamela, if you would like to speak, you have permission to do so now. I'm sorry, my uh, hand was actually raised for the prior question. Do you want to just give? Uh, um, do you want to? You can. You can respond since you're unmuted. Okay. Um, mine was looking for the statue to be a little similar to the the sister that spoke ahead of me, wanting to see. I, I don't know what the guidelines are set for the statue. If it can only be one embodiment of her, but again, something that's reflective of maybe her lifeline, something may, that may have her elevated and uplifted um, by those, those images being representative of the people who assisted in the Underground Railroad. So just not putting too many, putting enough instruction out there, but not putting too much parameter around the creativity of the artist to create her statue and have her statue stand so much differently than that of others that exist here and other places. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Okay, so we're uh, back on question five. Uh, the piece of, any, uh, any monuments or public works of art that inspire you the most that are um, that that you gaze at it the longest and think about and criti critique, and then what is about them that evoke evoke an emotional response from you? Susie, if you'd like to unmute yourself and respond. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Octavius Cato. I think he's probably the newest um, because of his uh, work in the desegregation attempting to desegregate public transportation in the 20s, you know, his murder, and also that's very emotional. But the statues that uh, I find conversing most about are the, what I call the fun statues, Rocky, the love statue, the clothespin, the monopoly pieces. 
uh, those are often the, the ones that people want to take pictures with, um, you know, tourists that come in want to take pictures with. And, and now when I bring um, Octavius Cattle, also within the city hall courtyard, those still statues and, and they're not statues, but the imagery within inside of that, um, is this African sculptures in the air. Uh, I find those um, very uh, inspirational, but I have to tend to point those out to people because they don't get the visibility of the other ones. Thank you, Susie. Bernadine, if you'd like to speak, you can unmute yourself now and do so. So I hope you can hear me. Uh, the question also asked about murals and at Broad and Spring Garden, and I think the Stevens School was this fabulous mural of this very young woman at the top, but at the base of that mural was almost everyone that lifted her up. And that was quite an exciting mural. Every time I went down Spring Garden Street, going from west to east, that mural would just zoom at me. And I always look up when I got to that uh, particular spot because it resonated that she's standing on everyone's shoulders, but she is large, almost like Walt Whitman. She contained multitudes. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy, if you would like to respond, you can unmute now. The ones that came to mind for me aren't in Philadelphia, so sorry about that. They're in D.C., but I remember distinctly the first time I saw the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and how um, it was so simple, but just all of those names brought a number into something that was really real for me in a way that the numbers about how many people are killed in war never could. So there was something super tangible and personal about that. Um, and the other one in DC that always strikes me is um, the Lincoln Memorial. For me, it's not the huge statue of Lincoln. It's actually being able to stand there in the presence of the statue and read the words. And so somehow the incorporation of words can really um, add a dimension to a, a monument that goes beyond just the representation of the person or people. Thank you, Tracy. We've got time for maybe one or two more responses to Alvin's question. Alert for music. There was a temporary problem completing your request. The requested reset. Nancy, if you would like to respond, you can unmute now and do so. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I think the, um, the one statue that has, has appealed to me ever since childhood, being a native Philadelphian, uh, was the 30th Street Station statue. I think it yeah, it has to do with the um, railroad, uh, an angel holding a, a railroad worker. Um, I remember as a child staring at it because it was so tall. And even as um, an elderly woman, I still find that the emotion that it evokes is what appeals to me most. Um, and then there, um, well, there's the Pieta, obviously, um, don't even have to describe that. I think for the most part, those uh, statues or monuments that appeal to me are the ones that evoke emotion, the ones that won't let you walk away from them once you they've captured your eye that you stare at and you can feel your heart beating. Uh, the sense of resolve, uh, or resolute uh, emotions captured in metal, um, in a bronze. It's the emotion that is the most appealing um, in all pieces. 
be they young or old, what is important, I think, is to capture a moment of... Um, Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. And I just want to also say the, the lady, Nancy, that just spoke, um, I like the way she summed that up. And just to reiterate what I was saying this morning, it's very important for this statue not to become a pigeon rest and, you know, where it just becomes part of the background or the scenery where you can sit there and talk and about other subjects and ignore it. It has to draw attention. It has to be powerful. It has to go with the setting and the architectural environment, but at the same time, it needs to be a conversation piece that people are just don't walk by and forget it's there. So I like the way Nancy kind of summed up her point. Thank you, Alvin. I agree. And thank you, everyone. I mean, these are really great. These are amazing responses, really. They're wonderful responses. And I know that um, just everyone's passion has come through. Um, and I know that you've inspired our artists and everything that's been said here uh, will be helpful to them as they're creating their proposals. Uh, these notes we're gonna be sharing, even the recording of this meeting, we're gonna be sharing and making available to, uh, to the semifinalists so that they, have, uh, they can come back to this again and again uh, as they need to. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we're gonna have opportunity for you. If you didn't get a chance to respond to these particular questions yet, um, you will have opportunity to respond in, in writing after this meeting. Um, at this time, um, I'm going to, we're, we're gonna, we wanna open it up, uh, spend a, a few minutes uh, for if the audience has any additional parting words or uh, anything that's important for the artist to know, anything that you weren't able to express um, that you haven't had the opportunity to share that would be useful to the artists in developing their proposals. You can uh, use the raise your hand feature and, and, uh, and share that. Barry, do we have any raised hands? Yes, yeah. Ashley Clark, if you would like to respond, you can unmute and do so. Yeah, um, am I unmuted? Yes. I was um, really responding to the last question because I know for myself, I was very moved by the traveling sculpture of Harriet Tubman that was um, in Philly last year by um, Wesley Wofford. And I actually was there the night that you all announced the sculpture that he was gonna do for Philadelphia, which is why when I joined this meeting, I was very confused as to what was going on. But now that I see the artists that have been selected, it's a little bit perplexing to me because I'm not sure how much race has been worked into this. It seems a little, I can't figure out what happened there. Is there anybody that can tell us? Ashley, thank you for your question. Um, the, so because this, this meeting and this, where we are now is a result of uh, the city of Philadelphia being responsive to um, you know, the, the comments and all of the feedback and all of the engagement that we've been doing them. over the past year. I'm sorry? I followed a lot of those comments and I was actually, yeah. was and really, so we, felt like a lot of people were very excited about they, that Yeah, sculpture. and they, they, absolutely. And that is the reason uh, why the city decided to uh, even commission a, a sculpture. Uh, and if you recall, we tried to purchase it, we couldn't purchase it. Uh, and so we did initially um, uh, commission Wesley to do the statue. But it, we heard from the community that said, you know, if we do that, it doesn't allow for a larger group to be able to apply to do the statue and also didn't allow for diversity of artists to be able to express uh, what Harriet Tubman means to them. Uh, and so we opened up an uh, open call for artists to allow for any artist that was interested to apply. We got 50 applicants to apply to the uh, call for artists. And uh, the advisory committee selected these talented artists out of the group of artists that were 
that applied. Um, and they were all selected based on their ability to, uh, to provide uh, high quality, engaging statues, uh, monumental statues, and also their response to questions that um, showed that they really had an understanding of the importance of this project. Um, and so all of that uh, is, is what brings us here today with these semifinalists. And I, and, and I appreciate you asking the question, Ar uh, Ashley. Can I, can I just add a comment? Yes. Uh, uh, just as a fellow artist, I have to uh, say how much I like the Wesley sculpture and how successful I thought it was. And I'm glad that it did find a home. Um, and what I am happy to see is that there'll be one more tribute to uh, Ms. Tugman, and I think there should be many. Um, but again, I, you know, I uh, don't dispute, uh, you know, his followings because he is a wonderful sculptor and I, 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 I enjoyed it. Um, and I wish the best uh, to all the semifinalists and I, I, I hope that the best version uh, becomes a monument that represents Harriet Tugman in, in Philadelphia because she is a great American. And um, by the way, I, I appreciate very much all the comments that came in and, and a lot were very thought provoking and so on. And uh, some of which I agreed with, others of which I think again, uh, you know, represent a different version but it's wonderful to see uh, citizens of Philadelphia get creatively active and involved in describing what it is they would like to see. So just a comment from, from a fellow artist. Thank you for that, Richard. Mary, do I have that as well? Sure. Um, I think for those people who are not in the public art arena, um, they oftentimes don't understand process. Um, most people are more preoccupied with product, in other words, the end product. Um, I think also too, what a lot of people are not aware of is how artists of color have been marginalized for centuries that in the public art arena, there are so few black people, people of color and women. And while I too am a fan of Wesley Wofford, I mean, I went to go see him when he came to New York. Um, I think that it's really important that Philadelphia paused and took note of how its community felt about process and that you guys were responsive and gave people an opportunity to apply as opposed to just issuing uh, a commission because you liked the product. And so there may be people who don't understand your process, but um, I, I really respect your diplomacy in issuing a call. Um, if Wesley wanted to compete, he could have done that too and, and possibly won his commission back. But the point of it is, is that what a lot of people want really understanding or valuing is the fact of how much people of color and women have been marginalized in this arena. And, and you guys are addressing that beautifully. I think you're doing a wonderful job in terms of your transparency now, in terms of your civic engagement. And I think those people who uh, are confused, if they stick with you throughout the process at the back end, they're going to value more what you call yourself trying to do. And Vinny, I totally agree with you. And I just wanna add two quick comments. Um, one is that, you know, I want to thank Philadelphians. I know um, Maisha is on this call. Um, I know there were some other like really strong advocates who really led the um, the advocacy to make this an open call. And and if not for that advocacy, and you know, the city would not have pivoted. So we owe a lot of gratitude to. Maisha Sullivan, um, uh, Faye, and the whole group um, for their advocacy. So I wanted to give credit to them for helping us and sort of make that decision. And then secondly, you know, this group of artists, you know, Wesley's statue was, was beautiful. It was an interpretation of Harriet Tubman that I think um, we all really loved and it was very engaging. 
Um, but I, I am so confident just based on the talent that we have on this call that we're going to get something that is as engaging and as beautiful. And I love the fact that we had so much input from the public with different stories that could be told. Like we know what story A Journey to Freedom would have told, but there are all of these other ideas that we just heard from the public and you all have your own ideas. So I am very, I'm happy for the pivot. I think that it was the right thing to do. I am happy for you all, for your talent. Um, and I'm excited that Philadelphians are really engaged in this process and share such thoughtful comments. And I'm just looking forward to, to sort of the next step. Thank you, and I'd Billy. like to make one comment, just um, elaborating on, on Vinny's, Vinny's point too. I mean, for anybody that might have concern with, you know, the artists or maybe, obviously we're all African-American artists here, but when you look at the reality of what currently surrounds City Hall, there's no diversity in any monument at all, the colonial figures around there. There's no diversity in gender <laughs> that was around there. And there's no diversity in the artists that did them. So, you know, it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's, it was the almost, not only is this an understatement to say it's the right thing to do, but it's almost, to me at this point, what has to be done just to be inclusive when you have a major city in, in, in the United States and, you know, there's no, in, we're, we're trying to create a new, foundation for artists and whichever one of us get it, like I said, it will be a, a diversity in the artists around there, and which will probably be the only one surrounding that, surrounding that building. So when you look at that, you know, I just ask everybody, just look at the reality of what's there and what we're trying, what you all are trying to do here and what you have done. Thank you, Alvin. Yeah. Okay, well, we are at, um, you know, again, so we're at our, the end of our meeting. I wanna thank everyone again. Um, before we wrap up, we have one more slide with some, some, just some next steps. Um, so the recording of this presentation will be made available on OACCE's website um, by tomorrow, Tuesday, the 25th. And we invite all of you to send any additional comments about Philadelphia's Permanent Harriet Tubman statue by filling out the Google form, which is going to be available on OACCE's website. Um, also tomorrow, the deadline for comments is the end of this week, Friday. Um, also, if you uh, register, all those that registered for this uh, for tonight, you'll get an email with that Google form as well. If you didn't have not have an opportunity to express your comment. Um, verbally, you can definitely um, send it to us in writing. And uh, again, um, uh, after today, the semifinalists have just under seven weeks to create their design proposals. The full process is outlined on our website at creativephl.org. But the next milestone is the next public meeting where you will be able to see uh, where the semifinalists will present their design proposals and that'll be in June. And you'll have an opportunity to hear them describe their designs. Uh, you can ask questions and provide feedback and we will be announcing that date separately. And so again, everyone, thank you. Uh, you can stay connected to this project by joining the OACCE mailing list, uh, which is on our next slide at our, our website, creativephl.org. Um, Rachel, if you want to move to our next slide, just want people to, to see where they can follow us. Thanks. And so, yes, please uh, follow us on social media, Creative PHL. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And good night. Good night. Good night.